Shalom, beloved of the King. Praise Abba Yahuwah. Here we are once again coming together so that we can look at our Torah portions. And I know that once again I have now fallen a little bit behind as I had my husband visiting me um, last week. And so it's just been an extremely busy time. But praise the Father. Father will give me the grace and I will once again be on track again. And so today we are looking at Torah portion Tet Savah, and it's Torah portion number 20. And, as, and it, it, it says, you shall command, you, shall, you are to order. So you shall command, you are to order. That's what Tet Savah means, Tet Savah, Tet Savah. And it's Exodus chapter 27 verse 20 to Exodus chapter 30 verse 10. And then the half Torah portion that we're going to look at is from Ezekiel 43, verses 10 to 27. And so this Torah portion has really taken me time. As, as Like I said to you, I think this is the whole thing. I've been sitting with this Torah portion this week, and it's just, there's so much that the Father has revealed to me from this Torah portion that it's just too much for me to be able to put it all together in the time that we have in doing a Torah portion because I know people generally don't want to listen to long teachings unless they are really captivated because we've become so accustomed to little two minutes and three minutes little TikTok messages that we don't actually want to listen to a message that is long but yet the Torah portions have been laid out for us so that we may understand to go deeper. And if I can honestly tell you, if I can honestly tell you, I know that this is going against the grain at the moment because you've got all these people doing Torah portions and they're still following the old system because it takes time for people to come into something new. But let me tell you something. And this is my own personal experience. From the time that I made the decision to be obedient to the Father, which he was already talking to me to do this, the end of 2021, and I did not do it. And now when I finally became obedient at this new year, to be able to put into practice what it is that he's asking me to do, I stand in awe of how the Father has orchestrated everything and how our Torah portions are just lining in with exactly even the months that we are in. It's all just lining up. The revelation that is given. And you know, I have been working through Torah portions myself personally. I've been working through these Torah portions. I think I started working through them. I don't know if it was by 2008. I started working through the Torah portions. And then we started working through them as a family. Every Shabbat we used to sit together on a Friday night and be able to work through the Torah portions together as a family. And we did this for a few years. But I can honestly say to you, I've never had the amount of revelation being given to me since I have become obedient to be able to do the Torah portions according to the Father's timeline. Because when I look at the month that we are in, when I look at the Torah portions that is that we are working through, if I look at last month, because we've now just entered into the new month of the month of, of Elul, and we were in the month of Av, and what was the Father revealing to us in the month of Av, which is the month of Avinu, the month of the Father, which is the fifth month, which is His grace, we started going into the place of where the Father was taking us deeper into his foundation, revealing his name, revealing his, his, his covenant, taking us into foundational things. But it started with the month before. It started with the fourth month. Because from the time that I came back from Israel, and then we entered into the fourth month, we were in the third month, which was really about us receiving the Ruach of Yahuwah. And then we came into the fourth month and that's when he said, come up higher. 
because I've got deeper revelation to show you. Come up higher. It's the door. It's the fourth month, which is the door. Come higher with me. There's deeper things I want to show you. And then from there, he started to shake us and be able to bring us into deeper revelation of the foundation that we need. And so as we continue on this journey of where we are, of this Torah portions, according to the Father's timeline calendar, I stand in awe to see where we are and what are the Torah portions that we're busy working through in the time that we're in. Because you see, we've just been in this fifth month, the month of Av, when the Father was revealing to us about his Mount Sinai, calling us to a place of saying, I want to give you my Mishpatim. I want to give you my instructions. And now he's taking us deeper into the understanding that we need to become his temple, that we need to become his tabernacle, that needs to carry his presence, that he wants to be able to get us to understand that he's looking for a priesthood. And so as we're entering into the sixth month, the Torah portions that we're really looking into for this month is as we continue. Because it's really going to be this, what golden calves have you got in your life? What is there that you need to lay down? That was just this last week's Torah portion. And so Father is really taking us on a journey here and really taking us deeper. And for those that have embarked on this journey, because, you know, if I go on YouTube, I really don't see anybody else. You know, we're all very quick to be able to come out of the calendar, come out of all these other systems that are religious systems. But when it comes to doing Torah portions, we're not willing to return back to his calendar starting at the new year, which is actually in the month of Aviv. But when we come in line with the Father's order and the Father's way, because you see, there's a broad path and then there's a narrow path. And when we come in line with being obedient to him, we stand in awe of how he's the one who will be able to do what he needs to do. And he opens up revelation to us like I've never seen before. And I've read this Torah portions many, many times for years and years and years on a cycle, the cycle that keeps repeating itself. And all of a sudden, it's like these Torah portions are being read with new eyes. And so I must honestly say that it's, it's so overwhelming for me because I myself am on a journey that I, I even struggle to have to relay the messages to you because it's so deep, I don't even know how to start. But by his grace, you know what I've said to him, Father, you know, I can't give everything. But zone in on the important things that I need to zone in on now because when it comes to the tabernacle, this is just, it's, 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 it's one of the, it's the whole reason why I left Israel to come to South Africa was to teach on the Ark of His Presence that had everything to do with the tabernacle. So it is really, it's really the essence of everything that we need to understand because you know what, I have understood something. You know, we, we have giftings, we have anointing, but where's the presence of the Father? And this is something that the Father was showing me today. You know, the Israelites that came out of Egypt continued to wander in the wilderness because they were never really seeking the Father's presence. Instead, they wanted to hold on to what they had in Egypt, their religious systems. I call it the religious systems of Egypt. It was the leeks and the garlic. And, and even though they were slaves to the system, they still craved the system. Because that system is how we know how to behave. It's how we know how to operate. We only know how to operate in a religious system that's been given to us for hundreds of years. And now we are in a new dispensation. 
And the new dispensation requires us to be able to now have his, his tabernacle in our midst. And this is what the Father showed me today. That he said, you see, my child, when the tabernacle is in that wilderness, see, the Joshua generation that was the ones that entered into the promised land never knew a system of leeks and garlic and everything that was given to them in Egypt because they were never in Egypt. And what is amazing is that those that were slaves to an Egyptian system, to a religious system, will still want to resort back to the system that kept them slave in slavery as opposed to being able. And so they seek after the giftings and the anointings and all these things that's given to them as opposed to seeking the presence. And the problem that we have in the time that we're in now is we void of the presence of the Father. The presence of the Father is not with us. And that is why I understood today why the fallen tent of David needs to arise. Because until the people become the tabernacle that's going to carry his presence, we are going to be void of many things. Because we are not being led by the Ruach of Yahuwah. We are still bound by religious systems. And I really pray that as we've entered into this month of Alul, I really pray that we will be set free and start coming into the fullness of what the Father's got for us. So let us pray. Abba Yahuwah, I just want to praise you and I just want to thank you, my Father. I thank you for what you are doing in our midst in this hour. I thank you that we want to be those that don't just want to be able to be gifted and anointed, but we want to be those that want to be able to be the carriers of your presence so that we may be able to dwell in your presence, that we may truly become the ark that carries your presence because that is ultimately what you want. And I thank you, my Father, that as we are working through this tabernacle and that we need to understand what it is that you are showing us, that you will open up the mind of our understanding, that you will open up our hearts, that you will open us up to be able to understand the deeper revelation of the things that you're wanting to show us. Because we are in the time now where truly this is the month of the sixth month and the sixth is really the number of man, but it's also the letter Vav, which is the, the letter that he created man to be able to be joined to him, to become those that would subdue the earth. And you created us in your image to subdue and rule this earth. Now we lost that. But Yeshua has come to reinstate it through the state where he was nailed at the stake. And in this month, that he will just help us to return back to that place where we can once again return back to our Father. Be nailed back to him. Be in his presence and dwell in his presence. And so, Father, I thank you that you will just help me, Father, to just be a mouthpiece. That you put the words in my mouth that I am to be able to speak to your people. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your Ruach HaKodesh that I will just be a surrendered vessel that is just coming here to be able to relay to your people the message that you want to speak. The very oracles that is on your heart in this timeline that we are in, as we are preparing for very critical time ahead of us. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I just submit to you right now and ask you, will you come and speak, through my, speak to my mind and speak through my lips, the very oracles, and open up the mind of our understanding. Open up our ears that we will shamar. Open up our eyes that we will shamar. And we will be those that will submit and surrender to you, allowing you to have your way in us, in Yoshua's name. Amen. 
well, now the Father has really just already spoken, so I pray for the time that we need to do this teaching for sure. So we are going to read in Exodus chapter 27, verses 20, that says, And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So do you see, this was pressed oil. Remember, the menorah in the tabernacle was made of beaten gold. It was beaten to make the gold. And this is pressed oil that comes from olives. Now understand, for that olive oil to be able to be um, put in that, it's got to be pressed oil. Now, what has an olive tree got to go through? What is the process for you to be able to, you know, it's the most fascinating thing for you to, to go to an olive farm and really understand the process. Wow, I was, I, 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 I would never look at um, oil again to understand this oil the same way after I went to an olive farm and really understood the process. And so those, those, that, that tree gets beaten, absolutely beaten until those olives can be. First it's shaken, then it's beaten. First it shakes so that the olives fall and those that don't want to fall will get beaten. So the shaking will get you to fall and if you don't want to fall with the shaking, then you're going to get beaten until you fall. And then you're going to be put in an olive press before this oil is going to be able to be then the process. They're going to have to be washed and washed, and then they're going to be cut up and chopped until eventually separated. And then they've got to lay for a whole, almost a year, six months, they've got to lay to be able to then put them through the process again, and they've got to lay again to be able to get the right taste. So I tell you the process that it goes through. So we've really got to understand what this pressed, what this is, that this is about. So we've got to understand that this is basically, in order for us to be able to be a vessel that's going to carry the light. So understand, you're sure himself had to go through an olive press to become the menorah, to become the oil in the menorah that's going to shine forth the light. You are going to have to go through the process because it says to bring you, you clear oil of pressed olives for the light. So for you to have the light, you have to have the oil that goes in that menorah. So first Yoshua becomes the menorah that carries that light that is of pure gold that has been beaten into the shape of the seven branch menorah. And then the oil is the oil of that. He is the anointed one with the oil. He is the anointed one that carries the oil, that is the light that shines. So Yeshua himself, he went to Gethsemane, Gath, which means press oil, and Shemani, olive press. So Gath, Shemani, Gethsemane is olive press. And he prayed three times. It is a three-process procedure. The first pressing is the purest. That's the extra virgin. And that's the one that they would use in the, the, the menorah. And interesting, that's the first fruits. And Yahushua became the first fruit offering for us. And he will have a first fruits remnant. So if we look at Isaiah 35, verses 5. Just let's look at Isaiah. Sorry, not um, 35, Isaiah 53 verse 5, it says but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our crookednesses the chastisement of our peace was upon him 
and by his stripes we are healed. So understand, he had to go through the piercing, he had to go through the crushing, he had to go through the chastisement, he had to go through an olive press in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where he died to his mind, his will and his emotions, before his body was going to be crucified at the stake, before his body was going to be impaled at the stake, nailed to a stake. He had to first die to his will. That's why he was wrestling. And three times he said, Three times he asked the Father to take the cup away from him. How many times do we come before the Father and ask him to take his cup away from us? How many times? Yet, he said, not my will, but your will be done. Three times he cried out and asked the Father to take this cup away from him. Yet, three times he said, not my will, but your will be done. And so... We have a look, and we cannot look at a menorah, and we cannot look at oil. The oil that was put in the menorah without having to look at the ten virgins. And so we must understand that they were all virgins. And here we see that we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25, so that we can come and have a look at this virgins we see that the kingdom of Yahuwah is being compared to ten virgins note they are all virgins they all have made a decision to be set apart interesting being a virgin means that you have made a decision that you are ready for marriage you are set apart for your bridegroom so they've set themselves apart from sexual intercourse because they are virgins. They have abstained from uncleanness, from whoredom, from sexual sin. The difference is one is wise and one is foolish. So understand there are many in a, in a religious system or in a I don't even want to know. I don't even think I want to use a church, church um, system. But there are many that have set themselves apart in, in, in thinking that they are in following the Father. Let's just say they are on a path following the Father and thinking that we are the bride. And we are not foolish virgins. We are the bride. And as a matter of fact, um, most of um, most of the, the 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 churches actually, the teaching that is out there is that the church is the bride, which is absolutely ridiculous. Because he says that there will be those that will come and say, "I cast out demons in your name, I I prophesied in your name," and he says, "I do not know you." And so there's many wrong doctrines of things that we have believed. So we need to have a look at what does it mean to be wise and what does it mean to be foolish. So the word foolish is the word G3474 Morris. And it means to foolish, dull, godless. Now, sure. There is a scripture that says in the last days there will be those that will have a form of godliness but they will deny the power thereof because they are lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, lovers of themselves, lovers of the things of this world. So even though they've set themselves apart to say, well, I want to serve the Father, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to be this virgin that wants to be set apart for him. But I've never really truly committed to him fully because this is a process. So it means to be dull. It means to be blockheaded. It means to be stubborn. Now there was an interesting word for foolish. Foolish are stubborn people. 
So a foolish virgin is a stubborn person that is not willing to be open to receive truth. But what really disturbed me was when I read this. The origin comes, so it comes from the origin of 3466, which is the word masterion, which is religious secrets, which is mystic, which is mysticism. And that is very interesting because that is what um, a lot of religious Judaism gives us. Judaism gives us this rabbis take us into mysticism, religious things that all sound so wonderful that it makes one so um, drawn to this mystic way of the things that they speak. But understand, it's going to be void of the truth of the word that is to bring one to become wise. Because the truth of this word is what sets a person free. It's only the truth that sets us free. And it's interesting because that word also is initiation into religious rites, which is mysticism. So right now there is an order taking place where more and more people are starting to follow a lot of rabbis and rabbis' teachings. And they started off as being virgins. Interesting, they've set themselves apart. They've set themselves apart from the things of the world and came back to keeping the Father's order and the Father's way and the Father's commands. So they really walk out the Father's commands. But they are void. They are becoming foolish. Because why? Because they're going deeper and deeper into mysticism. So there's more than one way we're going to look at this. Because the more we thrive on the knowledge that we're receiving from the things that we study, many times we have the knowledge of all these things, but void of the process that we've got to go through, which is the Gethsemane, which is when Yeshua came to his disciples and said, could you not stay awake one hour with me to pray with me? Because you're going to fall into temptation. And they have not been able to be equipped in the understanding that we're going to have to go through a hard press we're going to go through a Gethsemane. We are going to go through the beatings. We're going to go through the persecutions. We're going to go through the washing. We're going to go through the, the shakings and the beatings to get the flesh out of us. So what difference does it make to have all the knowledge and the flesh man is not changing? This is the problem. And that's why there's so many that will be taking offense in this time. And brother will turn against brother because they take offense. And this is the problem. So the wise virgins is the word H5429, phronimos, phronimos. And they were wise, intelligent, mindful of one's interests. Sure. Thoughtful, they prudent, acting with or showing care and thought for the future. So do you see, they are mindful of what is happening in the time because their ear is at the heart of the Father and their finger is on the pulse of time. They are not foolish to just go about things because they're just acquiring all this, whatever it is that there's, there's more, the, you know, there's people now that are running out there that are just trying to, it's just like it was in the religious system of the world. We're just going to be able to learn more and more from this religious systems. It's the same thing again, it's going back to religion. Learning the things that will puff one up yet void 
of the changing of the heart, which is actually what makes us to be able to have the oil, because it's the oil press that one needs to go through and one needs to die to the lusts of our flesh. And man is going to be tested and tried in this world, whether we're going to draw, draw more from the things of this world that excites our flesh. The Bible says very clearly, if you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of Yahuwah. So he says, they are able to perceive and judge a situation. They have understanding. So you see, the most important thing is to have the understanding, the revelation of the times. They have understanding. The wise virgins discerned the times and were ready. The goal was on the end, not the here and the now. The goal is to make sure that we're preparing for what is going to be for the end, not for the here and the now. They don't live for the moment of the gratification of the flesh for the here and the now. They see, they hear the sound of the trumpet blast coming forth and they're preparing themselves and preparing themselves to understand the seasons and the times that we're in. That's why they had oil in their lamps because they were preparing themselves. They were making ready. They were getting ready. They were hearing what the Father's telling them to do and saying, build as I tell you to build. Do what I tell you to do because the time of the harvest needs to start coming in. So if we go look at Ephesians chapter 5, this is another place that it talks about foolish and wise. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to learn, read from verses 14, it says, This is why he says, wake up you who sleep. Wake up, you sleep. So you see, there is a bunch of people that are sleeping. And that's why where I stay, I look upon a mountain that's called the sleeping beauty. And I'm constantly praying for this sleeping beauty to wake up because I see this as the sleeping giant of the body of the Messiah that is sleeping that needs to wake up. Wake up, you who sleep, who still think you've got much time left over to say, it's not for now. It's still going to come. It's not now. We still got a lot of time to go. It's not the now. Before we know it, the time is upon us. And then what do we do then? And arise from the dead, and Messiah shall shine on you. See? Then you walk exactly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are wicked. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the desire of Yahuwah is. So you see, the wise understand the desire of Yahuwah. They are more concerned with what is upon Yahuwah's heart than just trying to be able to go with a system. Just being about their little lives and my little kingdom. Now listen to what the word exactly means. That's the word G199, which acrivos, which means exactly, accurately, diligently, circumspectly, perfect, straightness, careful, strictness. So that's why he's saying, so then you are to walk exactly. So you are to walk diligently, circumspectly, perfect, straightness, careful, strictness. Verse 17. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the desire of Yahuwah is. What is the Father's desire? G2307. What is His will? Does He want, what does He want to be done? What does He want us to do? You have a book written for your life and you need to walk that book out. There's a book. The books are going to be opened. There's books on your life. And there were 
things you were supposed to do that was written in that book that the Father had already purposed for your life. And then there is his commands, his precepts. What is Yahuwah's will? We're not to be drunk with the wine of the flesh, but we are to be filled with the Ruach. Because in verse 18 it says, And do not be drunk with the wine in which is loose behavior, but be filled with the Ruach. So if we're not the sons of Yahuwah, are led by the Ruach of Yahuwah, and they will be the true wise ones, because they will have the oil in their lamps, because the oil is the fullness of the Ruach leading us. There's many people filled with religion, not many people filled with the Ruach. Because to be filled with the Ruach is the fire that needs to purge every religious thing out of us, so that we are a surrendered vessel following him. And that's why it's a Gethsemane. And that's why the five wise virgins had oil in their lamps because they went through the process. They've allowed themselves to go through the process of allowing him to be able to discipline them, of, of being able to, to mold them and shape them to become everything that is supposed to be following the Father. Not one that has just set themselves apart to say, well, now I'm going to keep a bit of command so I go to church and I read my Bible and I do all these things and, you know, I'm part of all these great things going on over there. But when the sword comes in my life, I reject it and don't want to submit to him. The oil is the Ruach. It's the seven spirits. We need to surrender to be filled with the Ruach. The more of him, the less of me. It's not the works of the flesh. The oil is that anointing that we have. And it's not gifting. It's not a gifting. It's an anointing. And that anointing comes from our surrenderedness. That's why that anointing is the more you surrendered, the more you are obedient, the more anointing you will carry. Anointing doesn't come from your gifting. There's a difference between gifting. Gifting can operate. When the Father gives a gift, he doesn't take it back. That's why you'll see there's many people gifted. They can even do signs, wonders, miracles, but yet not at all. They can be so far from the Father because the gift will still operate. But the anointing is going to cost you everything because the anointing is the oil and that costs a price. It costs a price. That's why the, the, the virgin said that you've got to go buy your own oil. So let's go look at Matthew chapter 25 and it says, And the rain of the heavens shall be compared to ten maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five foolish. Those who were foolish, having taken their lamps, took no oil with them. You see, because they don't have an anointing. They have giftings. But they have acquired everything that they have in their lives. They've set themselves apart. They're following like a robot. But they're not submitted and surrendered to the Father. They haven't been through an olive press. They haven't really died. This is why Yeshua said, can you not stay awake for one hour? Because you need to understand, you are about to be tested and tried. So you see, this is the problem. When the tests and the trials, trials come, how do you behave? Because most people pray things away. That's why I said there's a lot of soulish prayers. And that's why there's very immature people. Because people can only mature when they go through processes. You learn from what you go through. You're sure learned obedience by what he suffered. There's certain sufferings that we've got to go through in our lives in order to be able to teach us. And while the bridegroom took time, they all slumbered and slept. So you see, this is where the bulk of the people are slumbering and sleeping. And, oh no, it's not now. 
we don't need to prepare ourselves because it's still going to be a while before Yahushua comes. But we see the, the axe is already at the root, but we're not preparing for what is coming. They don't discern the time. They're not prudent. You see, a prudent person was acting or showing care and thought for the future. They were preparing because they understood. Now, while the bridegroom took time, okay, and at midnight, a cry was heard. See, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those maidens rose up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. You see, let me tell you something. Religious in, religion is only going to carry you so far. When the, when the problem starts to come, if you have not crucified your flesh, if you have not died in your flesh man and gained the oil through what you've been through with your struggles and your tests and your trials, and you've grabbed and you've moaned and you've complained and you have not allowed yourself to go through the process and lay down your life, you will not have the oil that you need when the time comes. And the difference is, those that carry the oil cannot help those that don't carry the oil because we've had to pay for it with our lives. That is why the Father woke me up the Father woke me up one morning to a message. And the message was, I didn't even plan to read this, but I think I need to read this. Salvation is a free gift that we receive that was freely given. This was the message I was woken up to on the 1st of July. It was a Shabbat. Salvation is a free gift that we receive. That was freely given. That is grace. So we are in this grace where people have received salvation. That's the free gift. And a lot of people have stayed just there with their salvation. Anointing will cost you everything. We need to go buy oil. That's why there are so many people saved, but very few People truly anointed because there's a price to pay for the anointing. It costs you your life because you have to lay down your life to receive the oil. That's why you go buy gold refined in the fire. Go buy I self. That's why the ten virgins had no oil. Out of the ten virgins, five had no oil because they were not prepared to buy oil that had to cost them a price. The anointing will cost you a sacrifice. The anointing is going to cost you to lay down your life and follow the Lamb. Salvation is only the entrance. That is the free gift. And that's what everyone wants. To not have to pay a price. And that is why there are not many people truly anointed. There are many people saved, many people gifted, but not many people anointed. And it is the anointing that is the process of sanctification that comes with a price. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 says, It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. So that is why we are in these last days when we are going to have to lay down our lives. And so if we go look now, and that's why let's just continue our, our message over here. And it says, instead, go, go. But the wise answered saying, no, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And later the other maidens also came saying, Master, Master, open up for us. 
But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, because you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of Adam is coming. So understand, we have to be prudent, wise virgins that see the axe at the root and are we doing what the father wants. You see, father was working with Joseph and Joseph needed to be able to be in a position to be submitted and surrendered to the father. And he had to be obedient to the father, even to the point of having to be thrown into jail because he was going to be used as a deliverer for his people. But if Joseph had given in to his flesh and slept with Potiphar's wife, an entire nation would have been destroyed. So it had to take Joseph being obedient to the Father to bring deliverance to a people. If people are not obedient, people will die because of their disobedience. And this is what people do not understand. We have not been put on this earth for ourselves. We are put on this earth for two reasons. One, looking at Abba Father. Second, to serve our people, to serve his people. No greater love is there than for you to lay down your life for another. But you see, we are still on the throne of our own lives and that's the problem. That's why we don't give our lives, we don't lay it down. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 10. 5 to 10. And you have forgotten the appeal which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the discipline of Yahuwah, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For whom Yahuwah loves, he disciplines and flogs every son whom he receives. So the Father will continue to discipline us until we come in line with his purpose and his plan. But many times he's trying to bring discipline and we are praying everything away. If you endure discipline, Alua is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become sharers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So you see, the sons of Yahuwah are led by the Ruach of Yahuwah because the Ruach of Yahuwah is the oil that we need that brings the discipline in our lives to submit and to surrender to him and to his way. And that way is not only just to be able to keep his commands and his feasts and all of that. It's to crucify our flesh man that still wants the way of the world. Moreover, we indeed had fathers of our flesh disciplining us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed disciplined us for a few days as seemed best to them, but he does it for our profit so that we may be able to receive the oil, you see, so that we might share his set-apartness. So you see, there's many people that think they are virgins set apart to the Father, but they don't understand true set-apartness. Set-apartness comes from absolute discipline and obedience to the Father in surrenderedness. And that is a lot of testing, a lot of trial. And a father comes to be able to bring tests and trials in our lives and we go through persecution. And there's persecution that comes up against us. And there's things that come up against us. But how do we behave when the persecution comes? How do we behave when people don't treat us the way that we're supposed to be treated? Do we get offended? Do we lash out? What do we do? So we are all in the oil press. And we all have to go through this oil press and we all have to get our hearts right because 
there's issues within us that need to come to surface. And if these things don't come to surface, how do we know that they're there? So the Father brings the trial and the test in our life for us to know what is there so that we can learn to overcome it. Praise Abba Yahuwah. Proverbs 3. Let's just quickly read in Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the discipline of Yahuwah, and do not loathe his reproof. For whom Yahuwah loves, he reproves as a father, the son, whom he delights in. So he will discipline those whom he loves to be able to get them. I command you. It's a command. I command you to bring oil. Understand that this is this came with a command. Listen to what he says. And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil. We are commanded to be able to have oil. I hope you're hearing that. It's a command. If you truly want to be a son, you are going to go through a Gethsemane oil press. Or else you are an illegitimate child. Then if we continue to look at Exodus chapter 28, let's just continue to look at our story, our Torah portion. And you bring near Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel for serving as priests to me, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, the sons of Aaron. And you shall make... Make set apart garments for Aaron, your brothers, for esteem and for comeliness. Do you understand that you actually bring glory to the Father based on how you dress? He says, and you shall make set apart garments. So they had set apart garments made for them specifically for esteem, to bring glory and to bring Comeliness. We need to understand that. And so that comeliness is the same word for beauty, which is also to be able to bring honor. Now, that is so scary because these were the priests that were called to carry the ark of the Father's presence. And and the Levites that were the worshippers, they also had to be clothed differently. And now if I look at some of these worship leaders on a platform and they've got torn jeans and they, the way that they are dressed and the way that they carry on and I say to myself, that is supposed to be now, a set-apart Levite, that is the one that is supposed to carry the Father's presence to the people, the ones that go ahead, the ones that are called to carry his presence. So he gave them set-apart garments. And you speak to all the wise of heart, whom I have filled with a spirit of wisdom, and they shall make the garments of Aaron to set him apart for him to serve as priests to me. So the father would have those that would be able to be wise that had to make the garments. And they were also anointed and set apart for the father. So yeah, we see in this chapter that there are priests being set apart unto the father. Just like the five, five wise virgins are representing a priesthood. He's busy gathering his priesthood. Because from chapter 20, he wanted a priesthood. But then they were all supposed to be priests for the Father. But they were the ones that stopped him and said, no, you speak to us. Now he's going to have a set-apart priesthood but he's still looking for a priesthood, a set-apart priesthood. Because right from the time that he gathered them, when he went and he gathered them, on Mount Sinai, 
He wanted a kingdom of priests that were going to bring glory and honor to him. And they were the ones who stopped him. So he raised up a priesthood. But I want you to understand that the priesthood did not look the same as everybody else. This is, let this be something that stays with you today that was a revelation for me when I was reading through this. You know, I never, I, I, I've always looked and understood that, that the priests had to wear different garments. But I didn't really, I just knew that it was because it was to serve him. But when I saw that it says, for his scheme and comeliness, it was to bring him glory, it was to bring him honor, it was to be able to ex exalt him, it was to revere him, it was to honor him so that he would be exalted. I tell you, that, sh that, that made all the difference for me. So, in Exodus chapter 28, verses 12, and it says, And you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the shoulder garments as stones of remembrance for the sons of, of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before Yahuwah on his two shoulders for a remembrance. Interesting how it is two stones. Already then, there's going to be 12 tribes, but there's going to be two stones. Interesting how eventually it will represent the two houses that is made up of the 12 tribes. Exodus chapter 28, verses 13, and it says, And into the breastplate of right ruling you shall put the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be on the heart of Aaron. And he goes into before Yahuwah. And Aaron shall bear the right ruling of the children of Israel on his heart before Yahuwah continually. So Aaron was to carry that breastplate of those 12 tribes against his heart continually. It had to be hanging by his heart continually because he had to pray and carry the burden for these 12 tribes that the Father has wanted him to be able to pray for. And so it's interesting that the breastplate of right ruling. It's the breastplate of right ruling. So it's the breastplate of his commands, of his right rulings, because it says, And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of right ruling over his heart. When he goes into the set apart place for a remembrance before Yahuwah continually, and then an Aaron shall bear the right ruling of the children of Israel on his heart before Yahuwah continually. So Aaron's heart is continually going to bear these right rulings of what needs to be taught to these people upon his heart for his house, because it's about a house. And that's why that breastplate had to be able to be against his heart so that he could continually be praying for this house. Interesting how when we have a look at the pomegranate, then it says, um, uh, that there's going to be a pomegranate and you shall make the robe of the garment on all of blue. An opening for the head shall be in the middle of the woven um, binding all around. And verse 34, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden hem and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around. Now, isn't it interesting that the pomegranate, now when the father got me to do the whole teaching on the, pomeg on the fruit of the land, there is a series that I have done on the YouTube, which is on the fruit, um, on the uh, seven fruits of the land. And when you have a look at those seven fruits of the land, the pomegranate is very interesting because it is made up of the 613 pips, which is made up of the 613 laws, which really stand for his laws. 
that he will carry on him the pomegranate. Interesting how the pomegranate has a crown for us to overcome. The priesthood must overcome. The pomegranate has a little crown on it. The pomegranate is known as the fruit of righteousness, as the fruit of his commands. And if we love him, we obey his commands. And when the father had me do the whole seven fruits, the pomegranate was the fruit that was tied into the church of Philadelphia because they did not deny his name. They did not deny his word. And they will be those that will overcome and no one will take their crown. So if we look at Revelation chapter 3, let's just quickly look at Revelation chapter 3. And it says, I know your works, verse 8. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one is able to shut it. That you have little power, yet have guarded my word and have not denied my name. Again, verse 10. Because you have guarded my word of endurance. So you see, that will be the virgins, the five virgins, I also shall guard you from the hour of trial which shall come upon all the world to try those who dwell on the earth. And then he turns around in verse 11 and he says, See, I'm coming speedily. Hold what you have that no one take your crown. And so the crown that you have, let no one take it. And it's interesting how out of all the fruit he puts the pomegranate there. Because why? The right rulings is those laws that he has to carry on his garment to be reminded that he's going to have to be the one that's going to have to bring out these right rulings for the people constantly. <coughs> Teaching the people the Father's right rulings. The bow. The word bow is the H6472, Pahamon. And it comes from the root word H6471, which means this was very interesting for me because I've never looked into this bow. And it means beat, foot, step, footstep, order, rank, step. So the priest's footsteps had to be in order with Yah. They could not be off beat, but in line with him and what he wanted. So there would be a pomegranate to be reminded of his ordinances, of his right rulings, a bow to remind you as you walk, you need to be in sync with that pomegranate, his order. His ordinances, 613 laws, bow, pomegranate, bow, pomegranate. And his walk had to be in line with him. So his priest's walk will be in line with his set apart ways. Exodus chapter 28 verses 36 and it says, And you shall make a plate of clean gold. And engrave on it like the engraving of a signet set apart to Yahuwah. Interesting how it is from the time of the anointing oil for the menorah that now we have this whole, uh, this whole uh, Torah portion that is talking about the priests and their garments and them having to be set apart to the Father where the anointing oil is the very thing that is going to have to set you apart. They will be anointed to be set apart unto the Father. And they have to be different. They clothe differently. They walk. Their walk has to be in line with what the Father wants. They are totally set apart unto the Father. And that is what we saw, that the the wise virgins were the set-apart ones, the ones that in the end were set apart because they've taken the time to allow the process to go to work in them. So, 
So we have a look at Exodus chapter 29 verses 7. In Exodus chapter 29 verses 7, And shall take the anointing oil and pour it on the head and anoint him. So this is exactly like what I said. They had to have a turban put on their head. They had to have very specific garments being made. You know, again, the dress code, their dress, their dress code was different. They did not come dressed like everyone else. They had to be set apart. And in the way that they dressed, they had to be set apart because in their dress code, they bring in glory to the Father. But now, do you know that if you go to the wall, you know, in Jerusalem, you go to the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall, where everybody goes to pray. They will cover you up if you're not dressed in a, an appropriate way. Men's shorts have to be below the knee to cover their legs, their thighs. Women dress had to be below the knee. If not, they will cover you up. They will put a cloth around you. Your shoulders are not to be showing. Your arms are to be covered. It's not for you to arrive there with all this flesh showing. To be able to bring respect because they say on the boards, they say, please respect the holiness of the Father. Now that's one thing that I can honestly say about the religious Jewish people. They truly have an understanding of the reverence of Yahuwah when it comes to dress code. They really do. Which is something that has been totally and utterly lost in the Christian world. Because it's all about come as you are. You come as you are, but you are to be sanctified, set apart, made holy unto the Father. And now it grieves me in my spirit when I see these fashions with torn jeans, torn clothes. And this is the thing that people love to wear. And then we think we're bringing glory to the Father in the way that we dress. What set-apartness is there in that? What set-apartness is there in that? Can they see that you are different? Do they see a holiness about you? I think we have gone too, too astray in this area. And that is why I, I love being in Israel and, and, and really, really look up to my Jewish brothers and sisters that are religious, not the religious ones, because the religious ones are even worse. That, that is hectic in that land. Because you either on the extreme religious or you either totally worldly that will take off everything. And that is unfortunately what you see there. And then the Christians that come into the land that are supposed to be bringing a balance there, they are no different to the worldly Jews. And then they want to provoke Brother Judah to jealousy. When Brother Judah looks and sees, I mean, I have been with people that when the children are walking past and these women are walking with their short shorts and short skirts, dresses, and they cover the little boy's eyes so that they don't look upon their nakedness. And so then I say, from where have we fallen? Because we are supposed to provoke them to jealousy in the holiness of the Father. But we've lost it. And so the priests had to be set apart. Verse 7, and they and shall take the anointing oil and pour it on the head and anoint him. So he was anointed and set apart as priest to the Father. And that's why it starts off this whole Torah portion with, I command you to bring oil that was to be put in the menorah, and then again oil that was going to be needed to be able to anoint everything inside the tabernacle, every person that was going to work inside the tabernacle, anointing his priesthood to set them apart unto the Father. So that anointing oil was to be set apart. Everything was to be set apart. Verse 44, 29 verse 44. 
and I shall set apart the tent of appointment and the slaughter place, and Aaron and his sons I set apart to serve as priests to me. So in verse 42, a continual sending offering for your generation at the door of the tent of appointment before Yahuwah, where I shall meet with you to speak with you, and there I shall meet with you, the children of Israel, and, and it shall be set apart by my esteem. And I shall set apart the tent of appointment and the slaughter place, and Aaron and his priests I set, I set apart to serve as priests to me. And I shall dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, and shall be their law. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah, their law, who brought them up out of the land of Mitzrayim, to dwell in their midst. I am Yahuwah, their law. So here we see that everything needs to be set apart. So as the tent of appointment was set apart, our tents, our tents, as we are the, the, we are the tabernacle that now carries the presence of the Father, that we are to be set apart as his priests in order to carry his presence. Chapter 50, verses 1, and it says, And you shall make a slaughter place to burn incense on. Make it of acacia wood. Verse 9, Do not offer strange incense on it, or an ascending offering, or a grain offering, and do not pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he makes atonement upon it. Throughout the, your generations, it, it is most set apart to Yahuwah. And so here we see, this is the incense altar. So we must understand that the call of fire for that incense altar. Now this is all the furniture we have covered in the last two chapters. All the furniture that was inside the tent of appointment. That was inside the tent, the, the tabernacle where his presence dwelt. This was the last piece of furniture that was to be inside that tabernacle. And then everything else was in the outer court. But this was in the holy place and then the holy of holies. And everything inside there was made of gold. Overlaid. Acacia wood overlaid with gold. And this altar of incense had to burn. And for the way, when they were to come and light the menorah, they were to burn the incense. And the coal that was used to light this very altar of incense was the coal that came from the, from the brazen altar in the outer court. So they would have to take those coals and bring those coals. They were not allowed to make fire inside there. They had to bring that coals and keep those coals to be able to light this brazen, this altar of incense. And so this altar of incense was the sweet smelling. So it says, and you shall make poles, okay, verse 6, and you shall put it before the veil 30 verse 6, that is before the ark of witness, before the lid of atonement, that is over the witness where I am to meet with you. And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense morning by morning. As he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps between the evenings, he shall burn incense on it, a continual incense before Yahuwah throughout your generations. So we are supposed to be an altar that's supposed to be burning with incense for the Father continually. And then he says, do not offer strange fire, do not offer strange incense on it, or an ascending offering, or a grain offering, and do not pour a drink offering on it. So what incense 
We are only to offer incense for him, not for ourselves. Now there's all these people that want to bring all these oils and all these things, and they want to be able to start to burn incense. There's a specific man that even tells you that you burn this incense and as you take it in, it will open up your mind and your whole, this is all mysticism. Incense was not burnt for anything other than the Father. Otherwise, it was being burnt for other gods. So if you are just burning incense for yourself, then you must understand what you're doing. You're burning an incense to you being a god because you are not supposed to burn incense for yourself. So when you work through the, you walk through the old city of Israel, in the old city in Jerusalem, you have all these, especially in the, um, in the Muslim shops, they burn this incense. Who do they burn the incense for? If you burn incense and it's even for healing purposes, you are not supposed to burn incense for healing purposes because nowhere in the Bible does it tell you that you are to burn incense for healing purposes. You will invoke demonic spirits by you doing that. And if the Father has not given you instruction to burn incense for him, I wouldn't be doing that. Because let me tell you something, that is very much Something that is for him and him alone. And we had to be very specific with that. And so if we look at Psalm 141 verses 2, 2 to 4. Let's look at Psalm 141. Psalm 141, it says, Let my prayer be prepared before you as incense. So do you see, we are to become an incense altar for the Father. Let my prayer be before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. So we don't have a temple right now to go and burn incense. So our, 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 our lives, we are supposed to become this altar of incense. When our lives, our lives are to become a sweet smelling fragrance to the Father, our lives are supposed to be able to be the coal of fire burning in us is supposed to burn us to become a sweet smelling fragrance for the Father. When we become a perfect sacrifice for him, we first got to go to a brazen altar, lay our lives down. Then we've got to be able to go through an, through a altar, through a um, spirit and truth. We've got to allow the seven spirits of Yahuwah to be able to operate through us. And then we've got to allow the, the, the table of showbread. We've got to eat the word and we've got to um, allow the word to be able to be manifest in our life and walk out the word in our lives. Then we become a sweet-smelling fragrance of an altar of incense for the Father. Then our lives become an altar of incense for the Father because we are a submitted and surrendered vessel that brings glory to Him. And then He lifts us up and communes with us in the Holy of Holies. Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 to 5 and it says, To another messenger came and stood at the slaughter place holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him that he should offer it with the prayers of all the set apart ones upon the golden slaughter place which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the set apart ones went up before Alua from the hand of the messenger. And the messenger took the censer and filled it with fire from the slaughter place and threw it into the earth. And there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. And we covered this chapter 
I think for nine weeks of the of the book of Revelation, we covered the chapter, verse 8, chapter 8. And I think we spent just on this verse, maybe four weeks on who are the set apart ones. Because I was always under the impression that it's the, because the Bible talks about the, the prayer of the saints. So in church, we've always come to understand it's the prayer of the saints, which is the prayer of the believers. But these are called about the prayer of the set apart ones. The prayer of the set apart ones. So the set apart ones, it's the prayer of the set apart ones, which is the G40, which is Hagios, most holy thing, a saint, physically pure, morally blameless, ceremonially consecrated. Hagnos, it comes from Hagnos, sacred, pure from carnality, chaste, modest, clean, innocent, perfect, separate from profane things. So we offer our prayer on the golden censer before the throne. Our prayers are to be sweet-smelling aroma to Abba Yahuwah, and we must not offer strange fire. So do you see what prayers do we pray? There's only prayers that he wants on that golden censer. And that's not strange fire. That's not prayers for yourself. That's not your, your prayers. That's the prayers that he leads you to be able to pray. That's why I say there's prayer and there's prayer. There's many, many soulish prayers going up. Just today, I was sharing with someone where I said, you know, because there's a lot of things going on in Israel. I said, we need a lot of wisdom on how to pray for Israel right now. Because we've got to understand, if your sure is going to come, and that's the place where he's going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives, there's things that need to happen in that line, in that land that need to line up with prophecy. And the problem that that I really find is that people are totally void of Bible prophecy. They're totally void of the books of the prophets and what has already been written of what must happen in that land. And then we pray all these soulish prayers and we're forever praying away everything. But what must happen must happen. And that's what we've got to understand. So we are going to look at our Haftorah as we are going to start closing off this teaching. And we are going to look at Ezekiel. Let's look at Ezekiel, chapter 43. We're supposed to read from verse 10, but I actually want to start in verse 7, because I think this is very important from verse 7. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no longer defile my set-apart name. They, nor their sovereigns, by their whoring, and by the corpses of their sovereigns on their high places. So understand, they shall no longer make the Father's name unclean, become impure, become contaminated by what they do and by defiling his name in the defilement of the Father's name itself. Because his name is void. When they place their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost with a wall between them and me, they defiled my set-apart name by the abominations which they have done. So I consumed them in my displeasure. So they that's why the Father's name has been removed from people. Because they're defiling his set-apart name through their lives. It's better not to say the name of the Father if we do not walk set-apart before him. Because then we defile his name by our attitude and our walk and we don't portray him now let them put 
their whoring and their corpses of their sovereigns far away from me, and I shall dwell in their midst for ever. Son of man, explain the house to the house of Israel, and when they are ashamed of their crookednesses, they shall measure the measurements. Now understand, this is Ezekiel's temple, which I believe is the temple that will be in the millennial reign that Yahshua himself is going to build, that is Ezekiel sees. This is all prophetic. It's still to come. And since they shall be ashamed of, the, of all that they did, make known to them the design of the house and its structure and its exits and its entrances, its entire design, all its laws and all its forms and all its Torah and write it down before their eyes so that they observe its entire design and all its laws and shall do them. This is the Torah of the house upon the mountain. All the boundary of it all around is most set apart. See, this is the Torah of the house. So in Ezekiel, he is revealing that this is all according to his way and his pattern. And so we've got to understand that the Father has his pattern. And Ezekiel's temple is these chapters gets us to understand that many things are going to be reinstated again once we have the millennial reign. Because this is certainly no temple that was after Yahshua, the temple was destroyed. And there's no temple that's been reinstated. But they are going to want to reinstate their temple to put their anti-Messiah on a throne. And that is the great delusion that is coming. And with it, the great falling away. When people are going to get so taken with the temple, with the fascination of everything of the, that temple that's there, that they're going to fall into the temptation of the delusion that's going to come upon them. And so we are going to close off with Hebrews 5 verses 1 to 9. Hebrews 5 verses 1 to 9 says, And for every priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men matters relating to Elua. So you see, to truly be a priest, to truly become Abba Yahuwah set apart priest, you are taken from among men for you to be of service to, his, to those men relating to Elua. So you are appointed as a priest on behalf of men. So you don't become a priest so that you are a priest for yourself. You will truly only be a priest when you are serving other people. To offer both gifts and offerings for sins, being able to have a measure of feeling for those not knowing and having been led astray, since he himself is also surrounded by weakness. So you see, a lot of the father's priests have had to go through many things. That's why it's the suffering. That's why it's the persecution. That's why it's the pressure. That's why it's the, the slipsis that we go through. You know, the pressure and the pressing and the hardships and the oil press and the beating and the suffering and the surrenderedness. Because you have to relay this to other people. How do you take people where you've never been? The, e the, the best people to minister to other people are people who themselves have been through many things. So it says, being able to have a measure of feeling for those not knowing and being led astray. So the only way that you can have, you can really sympathize with other people is when you yourself know how you are going astray. But isn't it amazing that we are, you know, we, we, we tend to be so quick to want to judge the Israelites in the wilderness without realizing that we are exactly the same. And we should learn that we too are weak in our transgressions. And no one obtains this esteem for himself 
And so it says, and on account of this, he has to offer up for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. So as he repents on behalf of the people, he repents on behalf of himself. So as he's repenting for himself, he sees his own sinful way. Those are the best intercessors. The best intercessors are the intercessors that really see their own sinful way. And then they have the compassion for his people. Not coming from a place of arrogance and pride. The best intercessors are the intercessors that are truly, truly humble to understand that they themselves, they see their own error. They see their own wickedness. They see their own shortfalls. Then it says, and, no, and, and on account of this, he has to offer for sins as for people also for himself. And no one obtains this esteem for himself, but he who is called by Alua, even as Aaron also was. So also the Messiah did not extol himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I brought you forth. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Understand, the Father knows who his priests are and the Father will raise up his priests. He knows his priesthood. He knows who his priests are. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and petitions, was with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his reverend fear. So you see, they offer up petitions with strong crying and tears, and they understand the reverend fear of Yahuwah. Though being a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. So understand, Yahushua himself learned obedience by what, we, by what he suffered. Now, do we think we will not have to suffer anything? And having been perfected, he became the causer of everlasting deliverance for all those obeying him. So understand, as you go through your trial and your test, you become a causer of everlasting deliverance to all those obeying him. So by the test and the trials of the things that you've been through, you then become a deliverer for others. People want to be able to bring deliverance for other people, but yet at the end of the day, they haven't received deliverance themselves. You will be able to have the authority in the area where you have overcome. You then become a deliverer for other people in that same area. So we thank Abba Yahuwah for his word. Thank you, my Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, that you will continue to speak to us as we continue to look into these Torah portions. And thank you, my Father that you may be able to raise us up to be those that you have commanded to go and bring oil, that we need to have oil in our lamps and help us, my Father, to be those five wise virgins, especially in the hour that we find ourselves in. I praise and I thank you for this in Yoshua's name. Amen.